Ready to go? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, hope you had a great evening yesterday. I did, and I'm tired. <laughs> Apparently not 25 anymore. Um, so I did a talk yesterday about Bluetooth, and uh, um, another thing that I'm doing a lot is working like on the low level of Android. Uh, that those two kind of goes together because when you work with Bluetooth, you need to investigate a lot into the inner workings of AUSP. Uh, but then also when you work with uh, OEMs and ODMs and that make custom hardware, you need to do some system apps as well. So that's uh, another common thing I'm doing. So I've been thinking about doing this talk for a while, so this is the first time I'm doing the talk. So we'll see how it works out. So bear with me. Uh, but let's first, let's look at this one. Everyone remember this little boat and the incident it's caused? So we're still recovering from this when it comes to hardware. Uh, so anyone here who works on any custom Android devices, you know that it's almost impossible to get the developer boards from, for your certain chipset often. So they're, they're, like, they're out everywhere except for certain, some specific brands that nobody wants to use, really. Uh, and that kind of makes a problem when you're working on a device that's going to be released, but you still don't have the developer boards. You need to do something, and part of this is how do you get around those things? How can you write a system app for a platform when you don't have the hardware? You know the software that will run on it, uh, and you need to run the system apps, sort of. Um, and this is, uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is affects everything, like, even in the way we write software, which is, I didn't think it would, but apparently did. Um, custom Android devices, these are like two, two types, uh, and I kind of worked with both of these types. There are other, many other types. That are like, the first one is a digital signage. That's the terminology that you might have heard of. Digital signage is basically all advertisement screens, every, all the screens that you see in public that just show information or advertisements. That's called digital signage. That is moving to Android. In, like, that's one of the platforms they're they are aiming for. So there's a custom Android device sitting in that frame there, and it's connected to the screen with HDMI. And the other one is the custom uh, tablets. Sometimes it's just a tablet. Sometimes it's a kiosk application, like a hotel check-in or something like that. Or a, you go to a grocery store and you're going to pay. That's often also an Android tablet. Uh, and then there are the more obscure things. They were like uh, in the automotive space, we're getting Android devices there running. Uh, Android Automotive is the official from Google thing, but there's also Android Automotive, which is like the custom version without the Google stuff. Uh, and sometimes there is a screen, sometimes there's not. So it's a big variation there. You might wonder, how do we make an Android Automotive without a screen? Well, I could tell you about that, but that would be a separate talk. And then finally, there is home appliances, uh, which is a common thing. Uh, basically, ovens, microwaves, fridges, freezers, freezers washing machines, dishwashers, etc. All of those. They're also starting to run Android on the high-end uh, devices. And then there's a bunch of other areas in robotics and uh, industrial applications, etc. So there are lots of these custom devices. They all run one... Oh, there are like a few larger manufacturers of, of, of uh, device boards. There is like the, the Jetson things from NVIDIA, which is used for AI stuff. There is the Qualcomm boards, which come in different variations. And then there is one from NXP. And then there is Texas Instruments with the OMA processors, which is kind of old now, and so on. So there is a bunch of these, maybe five, six, that you usually have to sl uh, select one of them, so to say. And after that, those, there comes the, the, the suppliers of these boards. So NXP, for instance, they don't, you don't buy a board directly from them. You go to one of their suppliers and buy a board from them. So it's like layers of uh, organizations and companies here. Um, so that's usually what, he, what you would do. Uh, this is how a developer board looks like. This is the IMX6 from NXP. It's a very low-end board, actually. I think this one is only two cores and like half a gig of RAM. You can still run Android on it. Maybe, maybe not 60 frames per second animations in Compose, but you can still run Android on it. 
Um, so yeah, so this is this is what usually what you have on your desk when you're gonna when you once you get the developer board, and that's what you're gonna work with. Um, so now, what about system apps? So let's define the system apps versus regular apps. And the the main thing is like you access what we normally call hidden APIs. Anyone in looked into AOSP, you know there's they add the at hide in the Java docs, and that way that function, that method or that class will not be included in the public SDK. You can't find it on developerandroid.com. Some of the APIs are not hidden, they're just very much protected. So they might be documented, but you can't really use them. Uh, uh, and that's because they're behind a system, that's a system API, so the, the permission check is basically making it impossible for you to use. So. A system app is an app that would use one of those. There is no point of making a system app unless you actually use a system API or a hidden API that's protected somehow. And the other thing is that you, uh, you have a signature and you use certain permissions. I'm going to look at the permissions. So the signature of your app also defines if you're a system app. And also if you're pre-installed, you might be a system app. And there are two levels. I would say that I, I, I say system apps are the traditional system apps that comes pre-installed and it's impossible to uninstall. But these days there are actually two or three levels. There is like system apps, there are privileged apps, there are OEM apps and vendor apps, so to say. So there are many different places in the, on the phone where these can be placed and they gain different privileges depending on where they were pre-installed. I'm just going to focus on apps that are signed with the same certificate as the Android platform itself. Uh, because the other ones are like just a gradient of that, uh, those kinds of permissions you get. So uh, and whether they're pre-installed or not doesn't matter anymore. If you're signed with the, the system certificate, you can be installed afterwards, which makes working with this, uh, this on emulators and developer boards much, much easier. So you don't have to push them into the write-only partition and stuff like that. <coughs> Why do you do it? Why don't you just set up AOSP and work from there, where you, don't, where you can have access to everything right away? Well, first of all, you don't want to do modifications on AOSP. You want to avoid that because it's costly once you have to upgrade to the next Android version. It also takes, like the developer tooling is not as good as for Android apps. Uh, very far from it. You can't use Mac, Mac OS or Windows to do AOSP development. You need to use Linux. You need a fairly powerful Linux machine to compile the entire AOSP, if, unless you feel like waiting a couple of hours. Uh, I got a Linux desktop on my uh, desk, a little thing there with like, I think I have like 12 cores, and I can build AOSP from scratch in about two, two and a half hours. Like, the next rebuild will of course be faster, but that's a clean build, and that's like a lot of time. So you, don't re you really want to avoid those. You know? Um, so yeah, faster iterations is, is one thing you want to aim for. Um, so the first thing you do, if you want to get started with this, is to get the right key store. And this uh, the AOSP source code itself contains a test key store that is used for all user debug and engineering builds. And user debug and engineering builds are the ones we want to do. Those are the ones that we use for development. They're not used for release or production. So Think of this as like the debug key that we use otherwise. So the way to convert it is by using OpenSSL. Uh, you run these commands. I'm not going to explain in detail, but the first one like converts it to a one format, and then you uh, you get a key, uh, you get a signing key, and like a public-private key thing, and then you convert it in three steps, and finally you use a key store, a key tool, to import it into a key store, like a normal Android key store we use. Uh, where you set the password and stuff like that. So this can be fairly difficult to find. I, would, I have put up these slides already on Speaker Deck. The link is in the end, speakerdeck.com slash Eric uh, So this is, can be hard to find, and it can be a little bit difficult to debug it, but these are the commands you run to, uh, to convert it. Uh, then you get a key store, you add it, just add it to your debug build, and voila! Now when you build your app, it's signed with the same certificate as the platform, and you have access to all the system APIs without any constraints. 
And it doesn't matter if you're pre-installed on a system partition or if you are like installed afterwards on a normal data partition. It doesn't matter. So yeah, uh, we're done. No, I think <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a little bit more. <laughs> um, the second one, you need to run it somewhere. And uh, let's say you don't have any hardware at all. Like you don't, you don't have any test hardware at all, and you, but you need to get started on this one because they say that you, we will have this functionality, we will be using Android whatever version, et cetera, et cetera. So there is an easy way to do this. Uh, so either you build your own emulator with AOSP and just use that one. That's one way of doing it. You download an existing emulator with user debug, or you select one from the, use, uh, the device manager in Android Studio. So you take a device there that doesn't have the Play Store icon. That's important step number one. And the second step is to pick one with a target that doesn't have Google APIs. So those two steps together. No Play Store, no Google APIs. You get a clean Android open source project emulator. Do note, however, there seems to be an issue these days. So Google has not published any updates for the AOSP image, emulator images. There is no AOSP emulator image for Android 13. Really sad. Uh, there is an issue. Uh, I haven't added it here, but there is an issue on, on the issue tracker on this. I hope they fix it, because this makes it really hard to test apps on non-Google devices. So for many reasons, we hope they fix it. So this is one way to do it. Uh, then when you launch that emulator, you can go into the About the Emulator device, and you check down there, and you will see that it says user debug. And that means that it's signed with a test certificate that you just converted yourself. OK. It also says test keys there. So that's another clue. Um, <clears throat> another way is to use a physical device. So let's say you, you, you really don't need any special hardware. You know that you're going to have an Android device with a specific board, but you don't really you don't have any specific requirements on hardware itself. Uh, you can then take a Pixel device and do this. And the easiest way to do it is to use uh, to take advantage of the Project Treble. You all remember what Project Treble is: the generic system images. Basically, Google with Google builds system images that can be flashed on any device that supports Treble. And they build generic system images that are user debug signed. So what you do first, you just run adb shell get prop ro treble enabled. See if that is true. In that case, you're probably good to go. There are some more checks you can do. I've added a link in the end here to, for the, all the documentation for this. I'm taking, going through this fast here. Then you go and download the generic system image. Uh, it's on, that's it. you see the URL there, but you'll see another link e later. And here you have a different variance to choose, and it's usually it's the one to the left, the most left. And you make sure you pick the one that is ARM V8. And you take the latest one and you download that one, and it's quite large. It could be a gigabyte or something like that. That's just the system image, okay? Next step, so you unzip this one and you get the system image, and then you use a tool called SimG2Imager, which converts this into a generic system Im image that we can uh, flash quickly. So you convert it into the raw file there. Then you, you zip it, and then you push this one to the download folder. Okay? And then we launch the activity for, uh, for installing this one. And voila, this will then install this system image for you. So depending on your device, depending on your configuration, et cetera, et cetera, it might work, it might not work. There is a workaround here as well, is that you unlock the bootloader, and then you use fastboot and you flash the system image yourself, like manually with fastboot. That's also a way to do it. It doesn't, you know, won't make a difference in the end. All of this is documented here on developer.com, topic generic system image, with links to everything that I just showed. So that's another way. So then you have, will have a Pixel device with user debug on the system. So you can sign it with the same certificate, and now you can access all the system permissions without having to pop up annoying dialogues or worry about actually not, have, not being able to call anything. So now you can start writing code, right? Uh, well, first you have to know about protection level. 
So when I started with Android, and this is like 2008 I was starting with Android, we had like three protection levels, basically. I think it was like normal, dangerous, and uh, no, it was, yeah, three or four. Never mind, I'm old, so I have forgotten everything. <laughs> these days they have added a bunch of more constants for these. Now the only one you need to care about really is signature. That's the protection level that you need, you're interested in. Because if it, it, that is like the most restricted ones. That's the thing that you need to be signed with the system certificate. So once you're signed with the system certificate, you can use all permissions. There is no restriction for you, really. Well, there is a restriction if two installed apps where one declares a permission and is signed with a different certificate, then you can't call it. But that's kind of like besides the point here. Um, so yeah. You will look at this one, you get confused because there are so many options. Don't worry, if you're a systems, uh, system app, you don't have to care. So when you're working also, this is a tip that, uh, that kept bugging me for a week and I couldn't understand why. Every now and then I couldn't install the app from Android Studio, just nothing happened. It's because when you're installed as a system app, apparently it doesn't work anymore doing the, the new way of optimized installations from Android Studio, so you have to disable that one. So that's a good option to do. If you ever had that experience otherwise, uh, it's apparently sometimes it just bugs out, so it could be a good, op good option to keep track of in other cases as well. But for system apps, make sure you check that box. This is, this is in the run configuration in Android Studio. Um, also, another thing to keep track of here is that you can actually, in the run configuration, you can issue uh, package manager commands. So if your system app is not a, doesn't have a UI itself, it's just a service, then you can use a package manager command to start that service from here, or issue a broadcast that triggers it or something. So that's kind of convenient. Um, Okay, so there is also, the, if, you're, if you're a system app, you can be installed on, you can be pre, you're probably pre-installed. You probably want to be able to test that easily. And the way to test that is using the following ADB commands. So <laughs> there are a couple of them. So the first thing is yeah, you do ADB root. So if you're using a debug, you can probably run ADB root and you get root access. And then you just disable Verity which is a security thing that makes sure that nothing can be written to the, like, that the partitions are safe. You disable that one, you reboot the device. Once it's back again, you run ADB root, then you run ADB remount, which will cause the system partition to be remounted so it's read-write. Now, you make a directory for your system application, either in system app, your system app, or you can also have it in system app, priv app which is like where privileged apps end up. But that's a lower uh, access level, so to say. Uh, and then you push the APK to that folder, and you reboot the device again. Sometimes you don't have to reboot the device. It discovers it by itself. I found that a little bit flaky. Keep track of your version code. So I say that the first one you install when you do the system app thing, you have like version code one, and then you bump it in your your project so that you have version code 2 when you do the new installations. So it doesn't have the same version code as the one that is pre-installed. Uh, and then you can revert all of this again, so if you want to like, make sure that it's right protected and stuff, it's, that also works. You, this, why would this be interesting? Well, it would be interesting to see how does the device work when you actually uh, like have it pre-installed there. That's probably, but for everyday development, you really don't need to do this. It's a good thing to know how to do it. Okay, we got everything set up. Time to call the system APIs. So this is where it gets tricky. Uh, so the first thing you need to understand is the permissions. The permissions give you clue to what you can do. There is so much functionality in the system and the system APIs. Uh, so there's no like generic documentation for it. You can go to source.android.com and find out some things about this. Um, but it's really hard to find it. For instance, there is a permission for injecting input events. That one is great. I've used this several times for several different projects. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of, if you read it, it's kind of scary. You can inject input events into the system so the apps actually react to them. So you can make virtual remote input devices and stuff. 
But in the AOSP, frame-based core REST Android manifest XML, that's the most common path that you have to remember because it defines all the protected broadcast, all the, all, the use, all the permissions of the whole system, and a bunch of other stuff. You will look in this file a lot if you do system, API, system apps. So keep track of that one. Uh, so let's say we want to do input events. We want to inject that. Maybe we have a remote screen that we're streaming to, and we're touching the screen, we want to inject the events back to the, the app, or the, sorry, the device. Okay, we'll search the AUSB source code, and we find this function in the input manager. The input manager is in the official APIs, so you can actually get the input manager from the system service. But, as you see here in the end of the Java doc, it says at hide, it will not show up in the official Java doc, and it requires this permission. And the unsupported app usage is also like a signal that you shouldn't do this unless you know what you're doing then. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so how do we call it? Well, three ways. The first one, classic one, you've probably done it already, you use reflections. In the case of input events, that's probably a bad idea, it's gonna be really slow. But this works, but if you're calling a system API and you only need to call it like once during the runtime, then it's fine, that's good enough. Um, it does have the problem, though, that you know it might fail because this, if the signature fails because of a system update or something like that, then they made changes to the API. Few of these system APIs are like API safe in the way that they can actually change from like different patches of AOSP even on the same version. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's also a problem when you have this one. Um, yeah, but just regular you fetch the method, and then you call invoke on that method with the correct object. Okay. Uh, the other way is to add an interface that kind of fakes the whole thing. And this is really weird behavior for me. I think this look, this, it works, but it feels really, really strange. So you create a in, in this case, everything in AOSP is Java. So you create the, the, the Java file here, the Java interface. And it's, in our case, the only thing we're interested in is inject input event with that signature. We create an interface exactly like this, although the input manager actually is a class. Doesn't matter. And actually has more methods, and inner classes and stuff like that. It doesn't matter. This is just an interface that we add to our project. And then you build this, and when you fetch, the, in, the input manager from the system service as usual, and suddenly you can call this function, you can bind to it, so now you can do it fast, because it just finds the, me uh, the method signature. Awesome. That's kind of cheating. <laughs> it feels really, really weird, <laughs> but okay. Uh, and also, if you have many methods, it kind of gets awkward to do it, because I'm suddenly have it here. If you have many classes, and like, if there's a lot of things, it doesn't really work in the long run. But in this case, for if you're just gonna inject input events, this is the way to do it. Uh, although, I would say that in Android 13, there's something called virtual device that I'm gonna show soon, which kind of replaces this thing. Uh, the other method, okay, this is the third one, there's actually four methods. The third one is to extract the framework jar and Android jar from the device or the emulator repackage them, you first you run dex tools and you repackage them and you put them into your SDK and suddenly you polluted your SDK for all other app projects, but this also works. Um, build a custom SDK and if you're gonna do, be serious about this, and although the title of this talk is without AOSP, this is just a one-time thing you need to do. You build your own SDK which uh, you start like this, you sync the repo for AOSP, download the code, note you need a Linux machine to do this. Uh, there are many guides for how to do this. And then uh, you edit the AOSP stuff and add the stuff, that remove the hide stuff and things like that. And then you run this, build an environment setup, launch SDK engineering, and then build it, and you're good to go. Then you got an SDK with all the things published that you want. Okay. Uh, so you can start writing code. But it's not enough to just being able to access these classes, you really need to figure out how they work. 
uh, because they're not really documented in the same way as the official APIs. So yeah, let's look at that. And there we are then. So, oh, there we have it. So you go to cs.android.com. Is that too big, maybe? Let's do it like that. And you come to a page like this. So this is the search tool that you're going to get used to. This is the thing that you're going to look in a lot if you do the system apps. And you start by clicking here. There's Android X libraries here. There's Android Studio and Android LLVM. So you don't, those are not of interest right now. So this one. And then you have two projects. You have the kernel and you have the soup platform. The, once you click here, you come to the master branch. So now let's say that you're working on Android 12. Then you have to drop down here and a weirdly sorted list, which, yeah, here we go. Let's take an Android 12 image there. And now you can search for in that Android 12 API. Uh, I'm going to go back to, to the master. That's Android 13 or uh, actually even later. And I'm going to search for something called virtual device. And so it's a virtual device. And if you search like that, you, you get a, hopefully the first one will be the, the thing that you're looking for. Uh, it's one, sometimes, let, let's take a, take a more common thing. Let's take Bluetooth device. Bluetooth device. Let's say you want to figure out how that works. Once you search here, the search is nice and everything, but you see there's multiple versions of Bluetooth device to Java. And the one you're usually looking for will be under the pack, uh, under the, uh, let's do the full search here so we get it. Uh, packages, modules, depending on which version of Android you have. So yeah, the, right. Now the, in Android 13, they moved it into the packages. For, it was usually in the framework folder before. So this is the one you want to, look in this case. So there is framework, one of the folders where, you, where most of the system APIs are. Then there are packages where some of them, some of them end up. Uh, and then there is a bunch of them that end up in other apps and in testing, which has, and they all have the same name. So it can be very confusing. So let's go back to my virtual device and search that one and get the virtual device manager. That sounds like a good good entry point. Uh, and, and we scroll up here. So there's basically, there's basically no documentation. And I can tell you that this is a little bit documented if you go to sourceandroid.com and virtual device manager. And then it's there, it's mentioned here somewhere, so it's like Android compatibility doc efficient, uh, yeah, yeah. compatibility definition document change log. Uh, and uh, so the, you might get some clues from the source Android com about new system APIs, but usually it's a, a lot more, you, you have to do a lot of investigations into these parts here. Um, this API is a new thing that came in Android 13, which basically lets you define virtual devices on Android that apps can run on. With the virtual device, it means virtual input devices, virtual screens, and virtual sensors. So it can be something that runs remote. Let's say you have a screen, remote screen connected over the internet to your Android device. You represent that screen with a virtual device. Touch events that get clicked here and then sent to your phone can then be injected into the virtual device so that the apps running on the virtual device will react. So it's a really cool thing to do a multi-display solution with one single Android device. So this one is one of the more powerful APIs that, ca that came with Android 13. Uh, I'm not going like, to dive into the, this one too much, but there is one thing here, the annotation system service, context virtual device. This is what makes it you can actually like fetch this one. Uh, if you click on this one here, you actually come to the, the constant here. So the, you can fetch this one as a normal system service. 
Uh, if you do it today, you will just, because in the, you don't have the API for this one, you will just get an object, you don't know what to do, and everything is con uh, protected with system permissions. So you can't, you either can't even call anything here. Uh, but yeah, that's fun anyway. And once you have that one, then you can dig through this one. And the, the interface for this code search here is nice because it actually lets, it links you to things here, and here's all the usage of that one and you can navigate back and forth. Bookmark the stuff when you found it, because it's sometimes really hard to come back to the class and the stuff that you were looking for, and you go like, where was this thing? So yeah, that's a good, good tip. Um, there's much you can search for here. You can add filters, and you can search in the project, in the directory, everything. So it's a very powerful search tool here as well. Um, re sometimes there is plenty of documentation which is nice. Sometimes that, that very exhausted documentation is old and wrong. So, yeah, <laughs> good thing to keep track of. Anyway, um, back to my slides. There you go. So, yes, so that, that was it. So let's look at some interesting permissions um, that are there. I see I pick a really bad background color. Hope you can read. Uh, Virtual input device is the one that I, I think will be really cool when you're doing, a, a, for instance, when you do, if you're going to do digital signage where your device will have multiple screens connected. That will be one case where we will see in the future. Uh, you have some low-level, like, simple web-based web screen somewhere, and you can stream to, to multiple ones. Uh, so virtual input device is something that will let you do clicks on the remote screen and then inject it into the system. Uh, camera inject external camera. So one thing that is tricky is to, uh, when, if you have a custom Android device, is to uh, add a camera to it. Usually it involves a lot, lot of like low-level stuff, but let's say you just want to plug in uh, a USB camera. Uh, that usually works, and let's say you have, have a case where you can inject, like start up cameras later after runtime. Like you can plug them in and out. And that event here lets you do that. Uh, or permission lets you do that. Another really cool thing, which is, anyone worked with Android Automotive? No? Oh, yeah, one, two people. So that, yeah, so activity embedding is one thing that will be is used a lot in Android Automotive uh, already, uh, but now they have a, the permission for this one. So you can actually embed an activity inside another activity. That's kind of like how it looks today. Uh, another one here is start activities from background, which is something that you might want to do if you're just, you are a very powerful system service, you're just running in the background and you want to control stuff, especially if you have multiple virtual displays. Uh, you want to start an activity there, you want to start an activity there, you don't have a UI yourself, you just get reacting to messages. And that, that start activities from background is very useful in that case. Also. Start foreground service from background. Of course, you want to have that one, so you just don't have to care about all the foreground service uh, stuff. Uh, and this one will also let you start a foreground service in another application, even though that one maybe wouldn't naturally be allowed to start in the foreground. So you can kind of bypass it for other apps as well. Uh, system application overlay. This is a classic thing. You can basically render on top of anything. You don't have to care. You get a you get the possibility to just grab a window and draw on it. Uh, so yeah, there are there are many fun stuff to do. Uh, so yeah, we're coming to the end of the presentation. Uh, so how much system APIs do you need to do? That kind of decides how you're going to call this. Do you need your? Is it enough to have just a reflection to call the the one function that you, your app is needing? Do you need? Like, is it a little bit more and you will need performance? Maybe you use a custom interface, as I showed. Or maybe you do the custom engineering SDK, like build your own SDK and use that one for your development instead. Uh, bookmark the Android manifest XML for the platform. You want to go back to that one and check it and learn how to navigate the uh, code search for android.com. So, yeah, that was everything I had to say. And thank you very much for listening. You can find the slides up there. So, yeah, thank you.